Uh, thanks to you all for interrupting your days um, to join in on this. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I was really keen to do this uh, topic and to really support anything GCMA does for one sort of fundamental reason. And I, I think golf is quite a unique sport in that it's run uh, from the bottom up rather than from the top down in reality. Um, uh, outside of work, I coach my son's football team. Uh, it's FA affiliated and effectively whatever the FA say to me has to be done, I have to do. The FA absolutely run the sport of football. Uh, they decide on goal size, pitch size, amount of time playing, uh, on the qualifications I must have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and really across nearly every sport, particularly team sport, the way the sport is run top down impacts at local level. In reality, I see the opposite happening in golf. I see clubs effectively delivering the sport as they see fit. Um, and I think that is both a strength and a weakness. Uh, it's a weakness in that there are, um, and I, I'm damn sure that none, none of the guys represented today um, are involved in these clubs, but there are some clubs doing a very poor job of delivering the sport um, in a way that engages people, uh, in a way that um, uh, legally or, or nicely employs staff, and in a way that won't really help grow the game, uh, whereas there are so many amazing examples of, of the way the game can be run by clubs. And, and I'm gratified to see how closely England golf, for example, Scottish golf, Wales golf, are working with us all to try and bring this all together. But the club is such a key part of the way the, the sport of golf is delivered. The experience is so different club to club that it's, that it's really important that, that ourselves and everybody engage with GCMA and with you as club managers uh, to try and make sure you have all the information you need and all the support you need to deliver the game that we all love. Um, I had a quick look at who was on the call uh, on the, 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 uh, the session before I started, rather intimidated to see that Rob Brewer is on it from Royal Wimbledon because uh, Rob's Brinkman background means he's infinitely more qualified to deliver some of this than I'll, than I'll ever be. So hello, Rob, and um, apologies in advance if I get any of this wrong. Um, I don't expect 100 people. I think we're into double figures. That's a, that's a pretty good start. Um, the topic that, um, that, if I can get the screen to move along, that uh, the GCMA asked me to work on sort of fitted with the theme of the conference, which is around best practice. And it's a topic that is quite close to my heart because it's something that um, appears to go out of the window, particularly um, when committees get together uh, and start having ideas um, and seem quite often very keen to ignore best practice and, and just invent new practice that uh, they think may work. Um, I'm a huge fan of committees. I work with committees. I work for committee-based organisation, but I think one has to try and make sure that committee work is is rooted in reality and um, and best practice. I think is a really good way of trying to do that. Uh, and the idea of, of what how best practice fits with working closely with the team is obviously very important to me and to my members. So we're going to do two or three things. Um, brief introductions, although I think I know, having looked at the list, I know quite a few of you um, personally. Discuss what best practice is. Um, and then work out how that can apply to the course management team and, and, and the manager of the golf course and, and then hopefully draw a couple of, of pretty simple conclusions. So introductions, as Mike said, apologies for the photo. Um, my name's Jim Croxton. Uh, I've been working for Bigger Now as the CEO for just over seven years. Um, it was gone in a flash. Uh, before that, I was with the, uh, the PGA for quite a long time in a variety of roles. Um, 25 years or so now in the golf industry but I was actually brought up on a golf course uh, from the age of six and so I've, I've kind of never done anything else and that that again perhaps is a strength and a weakness um in terms of the, the I, I'm able to put that photo up things we had a decent start to the football season last weekend apologies there are any Arsenal fans on the call um I'm sure as members of the GCMA you're all pretty aware of what of what bigger does but just um I thought it might be worth just giving you a little bit insight into what we are trying to do. You know what we are, that's my office. I'm sat in that building as we speak. Um, we run BTME, which will be known to many of you uh, coming up now in January. We have a website, we have a magazine, we support our members. But over the last three or four years, we've tried to, to get our own strategy together. We didn't have one for a number of years. It was, it was pretty loose, but we're now pretty focused on three things. Um, they are first and foremost, just as I'm sure the GCMA is, um, we want to support and serve the needs of our members. Number two, we want to, su to support the health and development of the game of golf. And, and those two things haven't always gone hand in hand. Um, uh, it, it's, um, I've, I could get into trouble for saying it, but I'm, I'm sure we do have members out there who um, aren't keenest on, on golfers. Um, their golf course would be much nicer if nobody actually went out and played it. But of course, we 
you know, we need a healthy sport and a growing sport to support the golf clubs in which all our members work. And I think it's really important that Bigger as an organisation um, is involved in trying to make sure the sport grows and develops. And, and sometimes um, our role in that is, is, is to not stop that happening. Um, we, you know, it'll be you guys out there that implement Grow the Game initiatives that make sure golfers join clubs, stay in the game uh, and succeed in the game. Um, and sometimes our members have got to make sure they understand that and that they strive to assist those efforts as opposed to always aiming for course perfection. But of course, um, a lot of our guys are, are perfectionists, as we'll, as we'll discuss later. Um, uh, our third aim is to, um, and strategic aim, is to try, and we think this is the right time for this now, is to try and show some leadership to the sport. And increasingly, we're being asked by the governing bodies of the game, by the RNA, by the England golf, Scottish golf, Wales golf, etc., to assist them and to help them in providing leadership to clubs and, and the sport itself, along with people like the SGRI, to ensure that the, the technical detail is there to make sure the sport grows. So that's that's me and that's bigger. Um, best practice working with your greenkeeping team. I think the first thing to do is to is to try and define what best practice is. So I, I had a quick look online, um, Wikipedia, don't we all? Um, and it, it's as simple as this. It, uh, I, I have to say I prefer the phrase good practice. I think in a lot of areas there isn't always only one best practice and golf clubs are so diverse. This is certainly the case um, here. But uh, I think the important thing is to say that it's something that has consistently shown results which work and also the fact that best practices do evolve. Um, and if there's one thing our golf industry needs to do at the moment with um, the increasing pressures on, on people's time and, and money, it's evolved to make sure that we meet the needs of, of our current golfers, crucially, uh, and future golfers as well. So in terms of um, what that means for us, I, I did some research and I came across um, a study from Harvard Business School, which uh, talked about what good businesses do and, and what they have, um, excuse me while I drink a tea, what all good businesses have in common. And they, they distilled it down to these three things, which are very much in, American terminology. Number one, having a well-defined, clearly communicated strategy. Number two, consistently meet customers or members' expectations via superior operational execution. Number three, enable a structure that simplifies working in and with the organization. And putting those into, into English language, the thing that I feel that the golf industry is behind a number of other businesses on as individual clubs is simply working out what it is they're trying to do and then, and then communicating that well. Um, I often use the restaurant example. They're not entirely analogous, restaurants and, and golf clubs, clearly. Um, you know, they're a different um, leisure experience. But I feel that restaurants have, over the last 20 years or so, really worked out what it is they're trying to do, and they do it very, very well. And I will go to different restaurants with my kids, for example, or in a group of friends than I will do with my wife. Um, and you know from really looking very quickly at a, at a restaurant's menu or its website or, or even what it looks like from the outside and the customers in it what it is they're trying to achieve and yet I still feel that so many golf clubs are trying to be all things to all people they're trying to be reasonably easy and straightforward on seniors mornings three times a week but then hard as nails on Saturday when the club championship is on and and, and offer all manner of different customer experiences when really um, uh, business suggests a business good practice suggests that actually what you're going to do is work out your place in the market and then and then stick with that in terms of the golf course um where that manifests itself to me is in a, in a number of areas we, we have got to work out i think who our customers are at our golf club um uh, we've got to work out what they expect or or perhaps why they are members or, or visitors to your golf club um we've got to work out what we've got what 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 is what is our golf course and, and how good or how difficult or how easy or how manicured can it be? What will that cost? Um, uh, what can we afford, I guess, is the, is the supplementary question. And then, and then on top of that, then what do we as a golf club um, aim for? Um, and, and one would hope we aim for that, you know, somewhere near 365 days a year. Um, I, I've, I've not come across too many golf clubs and, and very often, when I say that, when, when we engage with a golf club, quite often it's because there's a problem. We're invited in to talk to, a, you know, to work with the, the management of the golf club and, and the greenkeeping team, um, and there's a problem. And the reason there's a problem, more often than not, is because of breakdowns of communication. And actually, fundamentally, no real communication about what is expected of the greenkeeping team. So therefore, there's very little chance what they're doing is right. Um, 
And this process of actually working out what the golf course should be is something that I think all the golf clubs I go to that have run well and are thriving have gone through and almost without exception, the clubs that aren't haven't done. Um, the important thing once we've done all this, of course, is to document it. And this is no different to having a, a business plan or a business strategy. It's effectively a business plan for the, for the golf course. And, and the, the, the best way I think of, of documenting that is in a course policy document. Um, most of you, if not all, will have heard of this. Um, they're available on our website. It's an RNA document. The best, the easiest place to get it for you guys, if it's not on the GCMA site, will be um, on the England Golf website. Actually, if you hover over the for golf clubs piece, it's on the sort of the front page of the menu there, downloadable, really clear document which enables you to set your golf course business plan. And then have, have that there as something which you can use to uh, set your strategy and work with your team, but equally defend uh, in terms of, um, you know, criticism from members or changing views of committees and, and, and uh, board members or, or owners, etc. cetera. Um, I, I love this quote, although it's um, uh, unfortunately Henry Ford didn't actually say it. I think that the thing about this is that whilst we've got to understand our customers, I feel that as professional golf club managers, which you guys are, um, it's your role taking suitable advice to actually work out what the business plan for the golf club is, what that golf course should look like. You know the members, you know your customer base, you know where uh, you need to improve to, to grow those areas of customer bases. You, you know where perhaps there are smaller amounts of the, of the customer base where they might want something different on the golf course, but, but it would not make sense to, uh, to change the way your golf course is presented or your whole offering is presented for a, for a small amount of the membership. I think the, the classic case there for lots of golf courses is, is the, the wishes of the very low handicappers, uh, often very vocal minority in, in the golf course. They have a very clear idea of what their golf course should be like, but, but frankly, with average handicaps amongst men being 19 and ladies being, I think, up in the high 20s, if if a golf course is only set up for the for the very lowest handicappers, you're actually you know making it difficult for most of the customers. I think there's a few examples, exceptions. Carnoustie, for example, is always you know thrives on being tough, and there are others. Uh, but predominantly, people go to play golf to play golf for fun. So I think there's a critical role in this for golf club managers. Um, I can hear some of my members um, being a little upset that uh, that the club manager should be a key part in this but i i absolutely feel that the leader of a business has got to has got to shape that business and has got to be really influential in making sure that the product that's offered is is something that's right for the business um but to to, to use an analogy and, and i use this at the, at the gcma conference so apologies to anybody that, that perhaps was there um i compare it to setting your setting your menu in the in the in the clubhouse um, I don't think there's any golf club out there or indeed any, any food outlet at all that simply says to the chef, write me a menu, price it up, and that's what we'll do. Um, chefs are, are passionate. Certainly if you watch them on television, they're incredibly passionate. Um, they'll want to do the very best things they can do uh, or potentially even the very easiest things they could do. But of course, that, that won't give you a, a menu that's appropriate to your business. It'll give you a menu that's appropriate to your chef. Um, on the flip side of that, um, I don't think anybody would have success where simply the club manager or the committee for that matter, write a menu, put prices on it and say to the chef, cook that. Um, obviously, the way forward in deciding something like a menu is for the, the, the club manager to sit down with those that are involved in uh, both, the, both the purchasing side to so understand the needs and, and the customers you've got, but then sit down with your chef and, and an F&B team and work out what you can deliver, what can hit your margins. Um, and then and then what you offer on a day-to-day -day basis to your membership and, and in my view how you go about setting up the golf course or choosing the menu that the golf course offers is a very similar process it's a process that's led by the club manager with a full understanding of a, a global understanding of the whole business what the customers need who those customers are an understanding of the resources clearly and, and where the finances are but then but then working with the technical experts the greenkeeper the course manager head greenkeeper or the rest of the team um, to then make sure that that menu is achievable, is achievable all year long, can be done within resources. Um, and we don't end up with things like, we need to take the golf course to the next level, which is a phrase that frankly means absolutely nothing if you haven't cl clarified what the level you're at is or what the next level looks like. So that to me is, um, is, is how uh, a club manager has to be involved to successfully work out the golf club's strategy in relation to its golf course. Entirely separate to that and entirely 
uh, down to you and, and, and other members of the, of the golf club team is your, is your offering, your membership offering, your green fee offering, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying for one moment that the course manager and head greenkeeper should be influential in that, albeit most of them are golfers with, with an understanding of the business. But in this area, absolutely, the strategy should be set jointly, uh, led by the course manager, uh, led by the club manager, working closely with the course manager and the team to make sure that something is achievable and, and then is done. Um, the second part of this then is to make sure it's done really well. Um, and uh, that, I guess, is where, is where you come in. Having, having worked out what, what the club is going to try and do, it's the manager's role to make sure it happens. And it happens practically every day of the year. And if, if it doesn't happen on a certain day, there's a reason why it doesn't. Um, how do we do that? Well, in relation to the course management team, I think the first thing is it's got to be documented. We've talked about this already. Have the course policy document. In this should be damn near everything. Anything that you feel is important to the way the club is presented, the course is presented and how it plays. Uh, including that, and I know we had a question, Mike, let me know um, from one of the people on the call around, for example, the use of winter greens. This is something that should never come down to one person's opinion. This should be a club policy. It should be something, let's take, for example, frost. Um, uh, I hear often from our members that, that, that to an extent, um, the way greens handle frost or handle being played on in frost varies uh, from course to course, dependent on a number of factors, quality of drainage, type of grass species, uh, the temperature, whether it's a hard frost or, or just a surface frost. The important thing is, is that you have the conversation on uh, what are the pros and cons of closing and what are the pros and cons of opening. Uh, the cons of closing clearly are, you know, dissatisfied golfers um, who may take their business elsewhere. And in some clubs, we had an article in our magazine uh, last year, which caused some controversy on members on a golf course near Glasgow that's decided to keep the, club, the greens open all year round, come what may. The only thing that could close the golf course is safety issues. They've increased their membership, they've increased their winter green fees, but they know there is a cost to repairing damage done in the spring. But they've had the conversation, they've worked out that the pros outweigh the cons. The greenkeeper was uncomfortable with it uh, at the start, but went with it, is now comfortable that it makes sense to him. He's having more budget to spend in the spring to get his greens fit, um, and clearly he's in a better place with, with a stronger golf business. I know of plenty of other golf clubs that believe that the, the, uh, the cons significantly outweigh the pros, because particularly on fine grass greens, fescue greens, and often the coastal greens, the damage to the plant when played on through frost is, is quite significant and means that, that the greens being a key part of that, of that golf course, if they're not able to present them in the right way in the spring or early summer, it has too big an impact at that time of year and, and that outweighs the, the, the gains of playing through the frost in, in, the, in the winter months. Um, similarly, things like green speeds, green firmness, organic matter um, levels, fairway widths, etc should all be in here so that first and foremost a new greens chairman or a new first team captain or a new captain doesn't suddenly change everything um there's a document which has been agreed by a, a group of people the, the club committee board club management etc and signed up to which gives you some consistency and also means that you've got some you can defend when when members are, are challenging um on top of the course policy document the important thing, of course, is to measure. Um, it was drilled into me many years ago working with the PGA. What we measure, we can manage. On screen are a few examples. The stint meter you're all aware of. The little yellow thing in the bottom left is a Clegg hammer, which measures firmness. Um, the thing on the bottom right is the STRI's clever invention called the trueness meter, uh, known in our industry as the bobolometer, which you push along a green and it measures the smoothness of the surface in terms of um, how much bobble up and down there is on a ball and also measures the, uh, the trueness, which is how much bubble left and right. Um, it'll give you deviations in terms of millimeters per meter. Um, and uh, if, you, if you engage with the SRI for their program, for example, uh, they'll set you some targets which you can work towards, which should go into your course uh, policy document. But I think there's a whole bunch of other um, things that you can measure um, as a club manager. You don't have to be paying for these tools and gadgets. Um, you can. You can set up simple holding out tests um, using a stint meter, for example. You can measure customer satisfaction. You can go out on a regular basis with your, with your course manager and just look at the way things are and work out whether you're, you're within your, um, your measurements. The important thing is if you are measuring, you've got a, a framework under which you can A, 
set plans for development and b if necessary take remedial action if you've got a problem um, that you you've got in terms of course condition it's not just somebody somewhere thinks the golf course is bad uh, you've got actual facts to hand and actually these facts very very often are really useful to dispel um, member views uh, I, I very often hear of um, you know some of our guys on the board for example saying that they've just had their autumn meeting and the green chairman came in and said the greens were way slower than last year or whatever they were way worse than last year and the course managers evidence would dip in the drawer pull out the stats and show them that actually year on year the speed is the same or the, the trueness is the same um really important to you in terms of being able to sort of defend your position um the key thing is and i think this is where i see the, the biggest breakdown that the smaller clubs the clubs that are struggling is the communication between the club in the, in the form of the, of the club manager or possibly the, uh, the, the Greens chairman, the Greens committee, the main committee and the, and the course management team. There is generally a distance between those people, a physical distance. The Greenkeeping team operate out of their facility. The rest happens in the clubhouse. Um, there is very often um, a difference between what one side of that fence thinks and the other. Um, the famous sort of line I always um, uh, used as used often in our, in our board meeting is one of the, the biggest issues with communication is the illusion that communication has taken place um, and very often it is felt by a club committee or a greens chairman or even a club manager that, that something has been communicated but all that means is the message has been sent it doesn't necessarily mean the message has been received and I'd ask you all to think um, in terms of what we go through in a little while around the, the people you have in your business in the greenkeeping team about about how they are who they are and how you can ensure that communication is, is two-way and is received as well as it is, is sent. But communication is critical. Every good golf club I go to, um, every successful club I go to, and every successful business I come across puts a massive premium on communicating, particularly internal, particularly making sure that the, all the teams in the business understand their place in the business, understand what it is they're trying to achieve, what the current issues in the business are, um, and therefore everyone's working together to the same goal. Best practice, as we've discussed already. Um, I think on top of that, a real critical thing, um, and, and the more sort of key um, uh, business leaders that I get the chance to spend time with, I'm, I'm a sponge, I love to find out what people who are successful do to make them successful. Um, the quality of management and how, how they empower staff to achieve, how they, how they ensure staff can develop, and how they support staff. Uh, these three things, along with the old fashioned elements of management, which is making sure we know what they should be doing, and, uh, measuring it and challenging it as appropriate, I think are critical, particularly when it comes to the greenkeeping team. Uh, I have a question apparently, which I'll have a look at. I don't know how that works. I'll come back to that later on, thank you. Um, so the final point which the, uh, the Harvard Business School felt, and I think this, we come into this quite neatly, is that successful organizations are good places to work. Um, and I think that is absolutely true in, in any, leisure or hospitality experience um, if you have an experience in a restaurant where the the waitress or the staff or the waiter or the major are clearly miserable it, it has an impact on your enjoyment of the meal or of the experience and the same is absolutely true in a golf club we're, we're hoping to make people happy on their in their golfing experience and in order to do that we need we need happy staff I, I have to say i think the biggest thing we could change in golf to make it a successful sport is that everybody involved smiled more. Um, that's golfers as well as as well as staff. I think that's it's critical that we that we remember that golf is meant to be enjoyed rather than endured. Um, and I find so many golf clubs putting barriers in the way of happiness, anything from from dress codes to making it really really difficult to get to the toilet because there's all sorts of locks in the way uh, to all sorts of rules, arcane rules and unknowable rules. And equally to, to you know, concentrate on perhaps on making the golf course really difficult to play rather than enjoyable to play. Uh, how can we make this happen in, um, in, in golfing terms? Well, we need to, in, in greenkeeping terms, we need to have a look at, at, um, at the people we employ. Um, and I joined this industry seven years ago. I knew some greenkeepers. I had a little bit of greenkeeping experience many, many years ago, albeit purely as a labourer. But I didn't know at all it was a massive surprise to me just how educated green keepers are and of course we at bigger are, are, are hugely involved in that but um across nearly every green keeping team every in the green keeping team there, there is qualifications all the way through the team and they're educated not just in terms of qualifications but in terms of 
certificates of competency and, and continuing professional development, we have something like 1,500 of our members are currently actively claiming CPD credits on a regular basis. There's a real commitment to education in greenkeeping. Um, they're very, very highly skilled. Um, I always say if you've got a problem, ask a greenkeeper to solve it. Certainly anything technical and, and, and physical, that's what they do. Far more highly skilled, I, I say, than, than I was expecting, um, their understanding of, of, of the aspects of the business. The thing that really surprised me, though, was just how passionate they are about their golf course. Um, and I think I use that phrase, their golf course, advisedly. Um, all of my members talk about, and there's me doing it, my members, um, as, if, as if bigger is my organisation. But they all take personal ownership. They all talk about my golf course. Um, and it is. Whichever course they're working on be becomes to them a, a very personal thing. And if, and. Uh, you know, I joke about it, but insulting a golf course is, is pretty much like telling one of our members that their children are ugly. Um, it goes down incredibly badly and they take it to heart, almost regardless of how much praise they've had. And, and as an example to that, I, I brought up at the conference last year at Mercedes-Benz World. This was the, the TripAdvisor rating for Mercedes-Benz World. Um, and I reckon that's pretty good. In my terms as a businessman, I've got 92% of people who've, who've visited out of, out of a lot of reviews think it's very good or better. Our members don't look at those top three lines. They're only interested in those bottom three. So 3%, which is, what is that? Less than 40 people didn't like it. Um, but those are the views that our members take to heart. Uh, in America, they call it the 10% rule. The, 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 mem the, the superintendent tends to listen to 10% of the membership, the critical ones, rather than the 90% that are either happy or delighted. Um, they take it to heart. We've had an incredible response over the last two or three years to the work we've been doing on mental health issues in our sport, in our, in our industry, in greenkeeping. Huge numbers of people that are working too hard, that are sleeping poorly, that have either diagnosed or undiagnosed mental health issues, typically stress uh, and depression um, uh, and issues with their work-life balance, all because they're hugely passionate and personal about, about the management of their golf course. And as, as you will have noticed in recent years, Mother Nature, in particular with regards to the climate, um, is not making it easy. The last few, well, the last, what, seven months, we've had, I think, the wettest sort of February-March spell on record, followed by the hottest and longest sort of period in the summer on record, um, both of which are incredibly difficult to, to deal with. So I think as, as managers, when we have these very passionate, um, and I think the same is true if you work in a creative industry, and actually there are some similarities between greenkeepers and, and creative people, I think there, there really is a, um, uh, a need for the manager to understand that and to work with that and not to fight it. And I think it is a strength. I think that passion, I love it when, when the team here are passionate about the work they do. You know you get better out of them, but equally you know that there are going to be some, some bumps in the road. Um, those strengths are often, you know, flip side of the coin that there are some issues to being passionate but I know what I prefer I prefer a course manager that cares to one that doesn't so I do think it's a strength but I think there are there are some weaknesses that are typically present in in greenkeepers and when you think about how our members came to be in the industry how they came to be greenkeepers their, their roots into it are diverse but there there are a few common threads and they have generally chosen a life outdoors rather than a life indoors. They have chosen to work with nature rather than people. Um, whether it's a, a conscious choice or whether it's a, a subconscious choice in terms of the way they chose their career, which means that there are a few areas where they are typically weak. Uh, I have some, some members that are extraordinary in all these areas, but politically, um, we, we occasionally cover sort of political awareness in our education programs. It's not something greenkeepers think about. It's not currently in the general training program to think about the politics of the role. Um, whereas in your role as a club manager, I think you're 95% of the time having to worry about club politics. Um, they're not generally natural communicators. Uh, communicating downwards um, to their staff uh, comes pretty easy. They'll have learned at the hands of their previous bosses. That comes very easily, but communicating outside of that is not always the, the easiest thing. Um, they're not always, uh, team players whilst we talk about greenkeeping being a team it's a little bit like cricket in that you play an individual role in your team you do your bit and then you come back it's only when big things happen like um greens renovations when actually the team works as a team uh, and i and i talk about the wider team there which is the whole team responsible to, for delivering the the golf experience at a golf club and and i i see very often issues between 
the greenkeeping team in, in the guise of the course manager of the head greenkeeper and perhaps the professional perhaps the general manager perhaps even the clubhouse team and certainly sometimes with the committees and, and the members because they have so they seem to have goals that are at odds um and finally i think uh, you know managing up is something that's so critical to all of us in all of our roles you know we all work for somebody whether it's a board or an owner or a, or a club chairman or a, or a massive committee and if we don't manage them we don't manage their expectations and, and and think about what we need to do to manage them we really can't do all the rest of our work for decades, greenkeeping has been predicated on prepare a good golf course and everything's fine. And that's no longer the case. Um, and I tell all of our guys as often as I can, you're not judged necessarily on the job you do. You judge on the job that people perceive you to have done. And in order to that to change, you've got to change their perceptions. So in the understanding that those are the strengths and the weaknesses, to me, it seems critical that, that part of good practice of running a golf club in the roles that you guys are in is that you take account for those strengths and particularly take account for those weaknesses. Um, an example would be very often clubs are asking their course manager to do presentations to members. And the majority of our members are very uncomfortable standing, doing what we're doing now, standing in front of a PowerPoint presentation, talking to it. Um, it's not part of their background. But as an example, take them out on the golf course, ask them to tell you about what they've done in the last six months on a green or a bunker in an area, whatever it is. And actually that becomes much more comfortable because that's what they do on a day-to-day -day basis with their own team. And I think we as managers can take account for their strengths and weaknesses as, as by being good managers, we can make their lives easier, which I think is, is our role. Um, in terms of just back to Wikipedia, just, just once more, uh, it describes management as being the act of getting people together to accomplish desired goals and objectives. We've talked already about the fact we've got to define those goals and objectives. And it talks about using the available resources efficiently, effectively. And I think the available resources to you as club managers is not just your machinery, it's not just your budget, it's not just your irrigation system or the land at hand, it's the resources inherent in your team. Um, and the, the ones you've got and the ones that perhaps you haven't got that you need to try and find to make sure you've got a, a, an efficient team. So uh, to conclude, and I, I will go to the, uh, the questions when the, when the chance arises. Um, first of all, work out the golf course and obviously additional facilities, whether that's practice facilities or further holes or whatever that are right for your business. That has to be job number one. Uh, on top of that, enable the team to achieve those standards consistently. Um, and in order to do that, we must, first of all, equip the team correctly, make sure there's enough of them, but then we've got to measure that. Um, I don't think I'll be thanked necessarily by our members for encouraging you to, to measure performance on a regular basis. I, I'd encourage you to, to make sure that process is a, is a joint process in agreeing what those measurements are. But it's got to be done. If you don't measure, you can't manage. If you don't have a way of, uh, of working out whether the course is where it should or could be, how, how can you manage those, those people and those resources? Um, and I think it's important to invest in the team personally, and that's your time. That's actually working with these guys on a day-to-day -day basis and in an agreed way, in a way that makes them comfortable, uh, in a way that and I know a lot of you will be doing this already, but having those meetings in their office rather than yours, um, in a place where they feel comfortable, giving them the opportunity to feel comfortable so that they can work with you so correctly. Um, and in simple terms, I think uh, if I had one wish for golf clubs in this country, it would be to just to apply best business practice in the way the business is run. A golf club is, is a golf course um, with a business built around it. Um, and therefore, the business practice has to apply to the golf course and the team that manages that golf course just as much as it does to the marketing strategy, whether it does to the food and beverage profit margins and, and your membership offerings. So to conclude, um, if I had one message, it would simply be that slide. Apply good business practice to the way you run your golf course. So thank you very much. Um, that, I think, is me. Uh, 35 minutes or so, which was about what we thought. The question I have had is from Andrew Gibbons asking, when there was a club manager and course manager in place, what do you believe the key roles input of a Greens chairman and Greens committee should be? Well, there's a question. I was actually asked a similar question at the GCMA conference, so thanks for asking it again. Um, uh, my personal view um, is that uh, if tomorrow a law came out that said there should be no Greens chairman and no Greens committee, I think the golf industry might improve, um, but they're there. Uh, and in a members club, uh, you you know, a committee structure is, is critical. And if the committee are going to be involved in anything, I guess it's got to be the golf course. Um, 
to my mind, the, 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 the way that any committee of members with a particular remit should work is to make sure they are effectively representing the members' um, views uh, in terms of their input into strategic decisions. Um, I think all committees should be strategic rather than discussing minutiae. Um, and I think they should also be acting as a as a buffer between members and and greenkeeping teams. Um, we had a member, one of our members in the Midlands was assaulted last year by a golfer, a club member. Um, he was so enraged by what he saw the greenkeeper doing that he attacked him on the golf course. Um, needed to say that that person is no longer employed there. Um, he, he decided that wasn't the right environment for him. I'm, I'm pleased to say the member himself was also expelled. But uh, I'm not saying a Greens chairman should be between uh, and should be refereeing that fight. But the, the process which um, enables members to engage with the people that are on the ground preparing the golf course, in my opinion, should be um, should be through a Greens chairman or a Greens committee. Um, and certainly shouldn't. That, that's where one key role is to provide that buffer. Um, in the same way as there should be a buffer, I, I guess, between members and uh, food and beverage staff and, and to an extent the, the, the pro shop offering as well. I think, as we sit here now, that is the only question. Um, Mike, are you there? I am indeed. Um, that's great. And, and thank you for picking up on that question from, from Andrew. I've just got a couple of things to, to add and I've just put a few links in the chat that came to mind when you as you were talking. Um, rang a bell when you were talking about perceptions that golfers have around course quality and not necessarily using that as, as feedback for, for course preparation. And STRI, and we, we did include this in the newsletter, I think it was last year, ran a, a golfer's grumbles uh, article, series of articles last year. And one of them was looking at perceptions of, of firmness and green speed and actually found that even amongst low handicappers, there's, there isn't necessarily any accurate uh, understanding of, of the differences so making sure that that doesn't uh, uh, influence things too much and hopefully that, that that's the top link there maybe that's useful for uh, any committee discussions that are going on and then also that that bottom one is the RNA link to the course policy document that you discussed uh, I'm pretty sure we've got it in the library and I will double check one thing I found interesting though when I googled that was loads of golf club course policy documents came up so they've I assume knowingly uh, published them um, to their website, so they're completely public. Um, then there's nothing clandestine about it. They've obviously been agreed at committee level, um, and you can presumably all do the search yourself and, and find those as examples. But I thought that's quite nice. That transparency of saying, "Look, here's what we're sticking to," uh, is presumably quite a good way of, of operating with a, a document like that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think um, you know I, that may have been a, a really preachy 35 minutes, and I apologise if so. Um, uh, our job is not just to preach to golf club managers, it's also to preach to our members to an extent. And um, one of the things we do talk about is, is making sure our members decide um, which hill to die on. And, um, you know, there are some things that, um, that our members, you know, through their education, their understanding of the turf, uh, you know, are, are critical. And it could be, you know, the use of winter greens in certain areas. It could be traffic management around a golf course in terms of, you know, protecting areas. It, 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 there are a number of issues that are critical in terms of the way the golf course is presented long term. There are also some smaller issues which, frankly, if if a decent sized group of the membership um, believe that something should be one way or another, um, a classic case from early in my career was was how long the carry should be to the fairways. And the particular golf course have got some beautiful areas of, of long rough between tee and green and, and heather areas and whatever. They were a problem for you know a, a number of the more senior members, and, and the member in question was was quite bullish that it's ridiculous if the guys can't hit it 100 yards off the tee, they shouldn't be out there playing. The facts of the matter are those guys are members; um, they're entitled to try and play the golf course. And if bringing that long rough or heather back 20 yards um, may, means that more golfers are happy, then that that's a hill that the greenkeeper shouldn't die on. Um, I know that chatting to my, my chairman, um, who's known to some of the guys on the call, Les Halkins at the, at the Richmond Golf Club, um, had, a, had a member forum for the golf course a couple of years ago. And the golf course was great and there was, there was genuinely, generally really good approval for the way the things were going. But the one message that came out from a number of the members was they don't like the way that, that Les and his team um, manage traffic around the golf courses, roping and staking and hoops to keep people away from places. Um, and in the end, 
you know, Les bit the bullet and said, let's just, let's do it differently. Let's do it in a way that keeps the members happy. It's a really small thing, but they, the members went away happy that they'd had, had their say and had some input. And it didn't fundamentally change the way the golf course was going to be, you know, conditioned and presented. So it does have to be two way. And we do ask our members, um, I think that uh, as club managers, I think we all want um, a greenkeeper to be pretty dogmatic at times. Uh, we don't want someone that rolls over, but equally want someone that in the end will understand um, overall business need and will work with you and I think that comes down particularly to the relationship between you guys and, and your course manager and the rest of the team. Fantastic thank you Jim. Well, if there's no more questions we'll, we'll wrap up there. Um, like I said at the beginning we will be uh, this has been recorded so it will be distributed next week in next week's newsletters. Uh, I was going to suggest it might be a useful uh, a video to maybe uh, show your committee or uh, sit down with them. I suggest you cut it off before Jim recommends the abolition of the Greens uh, <laughs> chairman, the Greens committee. Uh, make sure you've got your, your finger hovered. But I think there's a lot of useful stuff in there. And I think that the feedback I read at the beginning about the conference, it, it is often to, to describe something as common sense isn't necessarily a positive, but I think uh, there's a lot of, of, of common sense, straightforward things in there that hopefully are easily implemented um, with, with perhaps some, some politics as well. But um, hopefully it was really useful. I certainly enjoyed it. If, if you've got any questions for Jim, as I said, his details are in the presentation, which you will all get uh, as soon as we're off the, off the call. So uh, if there are no more questions, thank you very much for everyone for joining us. Next webinar will be uh, publicised in the next couple of weeks. And as he goes back. I'm going to get my contact details up on the screen in case anybody wants to find them now. That was probably uh, so next easy. webinar will be, will be publicised in the next couple of weeks, so register for Perfect. that. And Thank you again to everyone for joining us. And thank you, Jim. That was fantastic. Welcome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.